All right, let's get started. It is six o'clock. Good evening, St. Helena community. I am Mary Lou Wilson, your superintendent. And tonight we are offering a town hall where some of our uh, district experts will be sharing some information with you regarding COVID protocols and testing uh, to help you better understand how we will continue to move forward this school year. Before I begin, I wanted to uh, introduce the staff that will be with me tonight. Andy Stubbs, our Chief Business Officer, will be with me. Chris Heller, our Chief Academic Human Resources Officer. Mary Allen, our Director of Curriculum Instruction. And Kate Scudero, our Registered Nurse, who joined us just this year, and we're thrilled to have her. Last year, we started school in November um, with our students attending every day. Um, five days a week. And because of the community partnership with parents, our students, public health, all of the work that we accomplished, we were very successful. And I'm very proud to share with you that as we looked at the, the entire school year from November to June and calculated a positivity rate for employees and students, it came in well under 4%. That is because of the work I'm sorry, hold please. This evening, Claudia is here to interpret for us. I apologize, Claudia. She's going to introduce herself and share with community members who would like to listen to this in Spanish, how to do so. Claudia, could you please uh, step onto the screen and introduce yourself? Uh, yes, Ms. Wilson, thank you. Buenas noches a todos. Uh, su servidora uh, va a, tener, a darles el acceso a los servicios de interpretación que van a estar disponibles esta noche. Si quieren escuchar la interpretación simultánea de todo este webinario, lo pueden hacer. Uh, en la parte inferior de su pantalla, en medio, ustedes pueden ver un símbolo de mundo. Si hacen un clic uh, en ese símbolo, después les va a dar la opción de español, hacen otro clic y de esa manera pueden escuchar toda, todo el webinario simultáneamente en español. Uh, su servidora Claudia va a efectuar la interpretación. Gracias. Thank you. And thank you, Claudia, and thank you to the listeners who will be listening in Spanish. And so again, last year we started our school year on November 2nd with our students come with, coming to school every day for five days a week. We had a partnership with our families, with the public health department and primarily our students to follow the protocols. And we were very pleased with the outcome. From November to June, approximately three and a half percent or less of our students and staff tested positive over the course of the year. Using everything we learned from last year and looking at the new public health requirements for this year, we were able to open school to full day instruction. And we're so pleased that our students are with us every day for a regular full school day. There are some additional requirements that, are, um, that we need to talk with you about tonight. And so we will um, give you a brief public health update for the county. We're gonna talk with you a little bit about vaccines protocols and exposure to protocols, uh, ex exposure protocols and student testing, the strategies that we're using to um, ensure and work towards safety. And then at the end of this webinar, if you have any questions, we'll be taking uh, questions. All of this will be recorded and posted on the district website. And so if you have a friend that's not able to view this tonight, please make sure and invite them to go to the website to uh, take a look at um, the information. So the chart in front of you now um, is a chart from Dr. Relucio, our public health director. And it is a case trends chart that shows cases, new cases by month and daily cases. And if you look at the bottom of the chart, you can see that it's from July of last year to July of this year. And what it tells us is that the case rate hasn't really changed that much in that year with the Delta variant um, that has caused a number of additional cases uh, and breakthrough cases for fully vaccinated individuals, um, we are seeing quite a few cases in the county again. We have to continue to be diligent. We have to pay attention to the protocols, to the expectations of uh, California public health and to Napa County public health uh, to continue to ensure the safety of 
our staff and our students, and the community as a whole. This chart, along with many other charts, can be found on the Napa County Public Health website if you're interested in details about the county, and then also on our website under the COVID-19 hub, you'll find lots of information and detailed information about our cases and the work that we're doing with regards to um, COVID-19. Andy? Thank you, and as Mary Lou mentioned, uh, as a public school district, we are following the California Department of Public Health guidelines, which are updated regularly, and we monitor those updates. And then additionally, the Napa County Office of Education has provided all school districts within um, Napa County a document that outlines the, uh, the state public health guidance. And so masks are required for all students and staff in all indoor settings uh, throughout the school districts. And masks are strongly encouraged, strongly recommended in outdoor settings as well. With regard to physical distancing, while it's no longer required, uh, we are uh, maintaining physical distance of three feet or more in just about all settings across the district. And ventilation is another key way to help mitigate the spread of the virus. We have high grade MERV 13 filters in all of our HVAC systems across the district and uh, small portable air scrubbers in every classroom space and office space throughout the district. One of the most important mitigation strategies is to stay home when you're sick. Uh, and we'll be hearing more about quarantine and isolation uh, in some of the upcoming slides. The guidance also recommends that schools limit non-essential visitors, volunteers, and activities involving external groups uh, with people who are not fully vaccinated. And the guidance also provides our custodians with uh, cleaning and disinfecting protocols when a, when a positive case is identified. And I will turn it over to Kate and Mary. Actually, uh, uh, I believe uh, Chris is going to oh. give some details about vaccines first. Sorry about that. Thank you. Good evening. Um, this chart that is on display shows the Napa County uh, vaccination versus unvaccination rate. And you can see by the weeks in 2021, the complete variance in the last uh, probably two months between vaccinated and unvaccinated um, people that shows that unvaccinated people are 55 times higher than vaccinated. So with the case rate of 1,714 versus 31, you could see the value of being vaccinated. This is important for any student in RLS and high school that's participating in extracurricular activities. We're asking that those students get vaccinated verification to the office. Vaccinated uh, after uh, people participating in extracurriculars are less likely to miss practices or games due to an exposure. Unvaccinated student athletes or extracurricular participants would be automatically out for 10 days. So we wanna make sure that that documentation is, is provided to the office and ensure that our uh, secretary can record that information so we can keep that on file. On the next slide, this talks a little bit about our staff vaccination rate and shows that it's an extremely high rate at 96.7%. Um, that's, that's a very high rate in, in comparison to many other districts that I've uh, spoken to. And we continue to provide weekly testing for our employees once a week on Thursday afternoons. Uh, we've had 55 employees take part uh, in the last two weeks of, of that ongoing testing. But it is required for any employee who has not verified their vaccination or provided the documentation that they must test every week. I think I turn it over to Mary. Hey. Okay. <laughs> Hello, um, I'd like to just re review the exposures, what happens when somebody is exposed or if we do have a positive. And I, and I just wanna start with clarifying some of our, our terms. An isolation procedure is when somebody is actually has tested positive for COVID and they are remaining at home to prevent any spread of infection to others. The quarantine is 
when you've been exposed to a, a person who is positive for COVID, but you are not yet, you have not tested positive, you remain at home um, and away from others to prevent the spread. And then we have a new term that's come about since the beginning of the school year called a modified quarantine. And that is for somebody who has been exposed at a school, during school, and they are to remain and, and we're, we have a new program where the modified quarantine students can actually participate in school. And I'll get into that in, in just a moment. So on the chart in front of you, we have um, some, some varying scenarios for the different, um, the different cases where people are vaccinated, unvaccinated, if they were wearing a mask during exposure. I wanna just start by reiterating that if anybody actually has COVID or test positive, they are, would be in isolation. Um, and so they would be home and not part of this. And that doesn't matter if you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. If you have tested positive for COVID, you are home for the 10 days. You are out until 10 days, plus you have been fever free for 24 hours and your symptoms are resolving. So that's the isolation. For quarantine, we have several different variations on this. On the first row, it shows that if somebody is symptomatic, and they are fully vaccinated or not vaccinated. If they're symptomatic, it doesn't matter. They need to be at home. So anybody who is symptomatic is at home. You stay at home and for the same as the above scenario I just mentioned, for 24 hours have passed since you've had a fever without the use of medication, any other symptoms are improving and it's been 10 days since that started. With, with symptomatic, if you, the 10 day period can be shortened if you go and get COVID tested and the test comes back negative. You also can get a note from a physician that states that whatever your symptoms were, were not COVID. So for instance, if you were out with a sore throat, you go to the physician, you're diagnosed with strep throat, they write a note saying, this is a non-COVID issue. You bring the note in and, and you can be uh, returned to school. The next row, it um, delineates when somebody who is asymptomatic and they are fully vaccinated. If they've been exposed to somebody who is COVID positive, whether or not they're wearing masks, because the student is fully vaccinated and asymptomatic, they don't have to quarantine. The vaccines provide a protective measure for these students that they are able to skip the quarantine and, and testing. In the final two rows, we have students who are unvaccinated, they are asymptomatic, and there's two different types of exposures. In the first, in the, it's the third column, but the first case, it's the asymptomatic student who is unvaccinated, but both of the people, the person who is positive for COVID and the person who was exposed to that positivity were wearing masks and were at school. In this instance, we would instate what's called a modified quarantine. That person may continue to attend school as long as they are asymptomatic, continue to wear masks. They get tested twice weekly. And I'll expand on that in just a moment with the testing program that we're going to have at school. These students must quarantine from extracurricular activities, including sports, boys and girls club, during the time of the modified quarantine. They will continue to monitor their symptoms for a full 14 days if, to see if any, anything should um, change, if they become symptomatic. The, the very recent change, as recent as last evening, there were some changes from the California Department of Public Health. The modified quarantine, the, the length of quarantine has been shortened. The quarantine is now for if there is a negative, uh, antigen or PCR test taken after the fifth day, so that means day six, then the person can return to school after a seven day, return to full activity, excuse me, after a seven day quarantine. So that means day eight. A little confusing, but if after day five, somebody who is on a modified quarantine, they get have a negative test, they still need to wait through that seventh day, but may return to full activity on day eight, as long as they continue to monitor for symptoms and remain asymptomatic. And the last row is some, a student or staff who is asymptomatic, 
unvaccinated, but one of the parties in that exposure was unmasked. So typically an example of that would be kids playing outside at home and maybe having a play date, maybe they weren't wearing a mask, one of the, somebody ended up COVID positive. The person who exposed would need to remain at home during that time because somebody was not masked and so the risk is higher because that's how protective masks are. So because the risk is there, since they will be out for that quarantine period, there's a similar um, change in that protocol where the student may test, have, they're at home for the, for the full time until they take a test after day five. So that means on day six, they test. And then after the full seven day quarantine, as long as the test comes back negative, they may return to school on day eight and activities provided they continue to be asymptomatic and monitor symptoms for 14 days. This is really complex. I want to ensure that this chart is on our district website for parents to review, correct? It okay. is on our website and there will be a, a little bit of updating to that chart on our website because this is very new information that we're getting. Right. And that's the complexity of all of this. And it's been that case since March of 2020. The updates come to us on a regular basis and, and we do what we can with the information we have at that time. So um, I know you're going to do a few more uh, review of what you just shared. So here's the next slide for you. Thank you. So the California Department of Public Health is offering a program of testing in schools. And, and the, the, the purpose is to keep kids in schools. It's been shown that that's just incredibly beneficial to everybody to have kids in schools. So during this modified quarantine that I mentioned above, and this is where an unvaccinated asymptomatic student was exposed at school where both of the parties were wearing a mask. Um, the students who are in school will be able to be remaining in school during that modified quarantine period, provided they remain symptom free. There will be testing provided on site twice a week during the modified quarantine. These testing, the on site testing is going to be at set days at each site. So, for instance, a uh, a uh, location would have testing on Monday and Thursday. Another one would have it on uh, Tuesday and Friday. Next slide, please. So the testing protocols, the, there will be some information that comes home to all families that gives a, a really nice description about a little bit more information about the testing protocols. It also has a place for parents to sign up for consent. So we need to have consent to for students to participate in this program. There's a link in the information that will be coming home that provides you access to sign up for this program. It also has a really nice, um, some videos to show because this is a supervised nasal swab that the children will actually do on their own. Um, it's a rapid antigen test. And because we're doing them serially, meaning more than, more than once, a couple of days apart, um, we feel comfortable and we have been told that this is a really good method of tracking our students. So we have wonderful videos that will come as part of the uh, background for this information that you can show with your kids so they can see people their own age. They have kids of all ages doing the swab as, as young as kindergartners. And so I think it's helpful for our, our kids to see somebody their own age doing this kind of activity and, and having no problem with it. So that resource will be available. Um, the, the results we will have within 15 to 30 minutes. If a, if a test comes out positive, we will um, notify a parent and that student will go home for their quarantine at home. If the results are negative, the student goes back to class. We do ask that when you are notified that there has been an exposure and your classroom may be on modified quarantine or student may be on a modified quarantine, that you continue to monitor the symptoms for a, the full 14 days. This Anybody who is on a modified quarantine or a quarantine, just to emphasize, they cannot participate in extracurricular activities until they are released from that quarantine. Um, and as we've said in the previous slides, those, those days have changed a little bit. The quarantines are a little bit shorter now. Um, and we'll have all that information for you in writing and updated on the website. 
Thanks, Kate. And thank you for bringing your expertise to St. Helena Unified. We, we know that you worked with COVID-19 and protocols within schools um, last year as well. And so we're, we're very fortunate to have you join our team. So as um, Andy and Kate mentioned, you know, masks are important. And uh, as we are all required to wear masks when we are indoors, um, if we are with other people. So I'm sitting in my office right now by myself. All of the staff that are on this call are by, are by themselves. And that's why we have our masks off. If we're with somebody else, we do have our masks on indoors as well as, well as all, of, all of our children. Now, Kate says something really important about a potential exposure that I wanted to um, reinforce again with that strongly encourage. Our little ones are not vaccinated and don't have access to vaccine right now. And while it's recommended that they wear masks outside, it's not required. And I really want to encourage families to talk with their children and, and continue to urge them to wear masks when they're outside as well. Of course, not when they're eating their lunch or their snack. Many of our students at all four schools are continuing to wear their masks all of the time. Um, they are you know, considering safety for themselves and others, and we really appreciate that. And again, I just want to encourage all non-vaccinated to wear masks at all times, outside, inside, when they're at school. Our teachers continue to emphasize hand hygiene. We do continue to have the washing stations and sanitizer in a variety of places across the schools and in every classroom. Uh, we do, you, you do need you to continue to self-monitor your children and keep them home if they're not feeling well. Our staff is doing the very same thing. And again, if you're able and eligible to receive the COVID-19 vaccine, we really encourage you to do so. We've had a successful, successful time since November of last year, and I want to continue. I want students in school every day. I think all of you know that about me and, uh, and my core belief system. Our governing board wants our students in school every day as well. And uh, we have shown we can do it, and we will continue to do so with these modifications that have um, been made to support students being at school, even if in a modified quarantine. We um, now will take any questions that you might have. Um, uh, my executive assistant, Erica Madrigal, will be monitoring um, virtual hands. So if you do have a question, please raise your virtual hand and Erica will call on you and uh, uh, we will do what we can to answer the questions you have. If any participants in the audience care to ask a question, please hover towards the bottom of your screen where the virtual hand is and go ahead and click that button and I will unmute you and ask you to uh, ask your question. Aylesworth, I'm going to uh, allow you to talk now. Please uh, ask your question. Hi, um, I'm not sure if this was answered uh, before, but what if uh, we have another kid um, who's going to a different school, but they are showing symptoms of, of COVID or at least in that, in their like daycare or school, whatever, it is confirmed that they have COVID. Um, should we be keeping the SIP like, the sibling at home as well, even if nobody's showing symptoms in the house or how should we handle that? Okay. Thank you for asking that question. So what you're referring to, I just wanna clarify, you're, you're asking if, if you have a child at a different school and somebody in their classroom, um, there was an exposure in a different classroom, but your child is not symptomatic. Is that your question? Correct. So I have two kids at home and then one of them at their school, this incident happened, but at the other one, nothing has happened and nobody at home is having any symptoms. Um, so that's, that's a great question. And it's, it's one we get a lot. It's um, that's called a secondary exposure. So your child who's coming to, first of all, you would look at your, your kids is particularly the one who is in the classroom, make sure that they are asymptomatic. And as long as your child that is in the other school 
remains asymptomatic and has not tested positive for COVID, your child, your child who is in our school may continue to attend. And, and again, provided that everybody is asymptomatic. And Kate, just to clarify, if the child is asymptomatic, do they need to receive a COVID-19 test? Or um, if they're asymptomatic, they continue to attend school? The sibling who attends our school would not necessarily, would not require one. The sibling who attends the other school where there was an, uh, uh, an exposure would need to follow the instructions given to them by the public health department based on that exposure. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for um, participating. I believe that this is Amy on the call. So I'm going to allow you to talk, Amy. Thank you very much, Erica. Um, a, a couple questions. Um, I'm wondering what our case rates have been so far. I've been really curious. So now that we're a couple weeks into the school year, we should have some data on where we're at. So if we be really interested in that. I'm also wondering um, what the protocols are that would cause an entire classroom to need to quarantine. I've been hearing about oh, seven kids called in sick today, so everybody went home. Um, and then um, would, would that, in that case, if the whole class needed to quarantine, would there be a return to online learning? Um, and then I'm also wondering if there's still thresholds that would close, that would close a school. Um, I remember last year we had you know, a certain percentage of negative of cases in a school would close or in a classroom would close a classroom would close a school would close a district is that still the case or are we not under those guidelines anymore sorry for all right. the questions <laughs> okay okay so we're going to try and tackle those okay. one at a time so um uh, kate and chris i'll be coming to you um the first question about case rates um we uh can we held a chart on the district website all of last year that was updated every Friday that indicated um, any COVID positive cases that were in our schools, whether it was an employee or a student. Kate has taken on that chart this year and she began updating it, I believe the second week of school. Correct, Kate? So that yes. will be updated every Friday. And uh, Kate is very familiar with the numbers there. So I'm gonna let you talk about the numbers, Kate. And then also if you could talk about any, um, what, what would cause a classroom to close. And when you finish talking about that piece, Chris, if you could talk about what the options are for students who are at home with regards to learning. So on the website, I, I have been updating that every Friday. The, the current numbers show one, person um, in, I believe that was in the first week of school and there will, the last week there was not one and this Friday there would be one additional at this, so, at, so as, two of, cases. as of this minute, so two. Um, and so that, and, and again, that that is on the website. I do update that every Friday. Um, as far as the, the class closing, um, that was kind of a special event and, um, that was triggered. I would happen to be in the school. It was noted that, uh, that there were seven children in one classroom that were out that day. That didn't, um, that didn't make me feel comfortable considering we're in the midst of a pandemic. So I connected with our public health department. We did not have any reported cases of COVID, but those numbers, seven out of 20, were not, that those aren't good numbers. So I contacted the public health department out of an abundance of caution, we did have those children go home that day. Um, that classroom was tested and it, it had a very lovely outcome. It was just a, a, a strange confluence of events that seven kids happened to have symptoms that were from a variety of different things that day. Fortunately, none of it was COVID, but we wanted to really just go that extra step to make sure that our, our little ones are safe. And so we did close that, uh, that room down. Thanks, Kate. And then from the aspect of continuing their education, Chris, can you speak a little bit about what happened at that particular time and what would happen in the future? Sure. Um, are isolated or quarantined at home would be provided to independent study work by their teachers to complete up to 10 days. So depending on their duration out of, out of school, uh, they'd be provided um, simultaneous work to complete. That would be the equivalent of their classroom instruction. We don't have in place uh, with the sunset of Senate Bill 98 at the end of June, we don't have in place right now 
the ability to continue Zoom or Google classrooms. We are working on that with our teachers union to continue those conversations uh, in the event of not only COVID closures, but uh, potential smoke uh, or you know, air quality days that might impact our ability to conduct school in person. So um, more to come on that, but we're certainly working on ensuring that students don't miss uh, a beat in their instruction. And Chris, just to be clear, you said you're talking with the teachers. In the event that we're able to put something like that into place, it would be above and beyond what is expected of the California Department of Education, and it would be our teachers really going an extra mile for, for students. Yes. In our school calendar, we've built in three uh, emergency days for things of that nature where air quality is poor or we're unable to conduct school. Uh, but this would be something that we could do internally in the district to maintain those student days uh, that would not uh, you know, qualify in the state, uh, California Department of Education eyes, but yet satisfy our uh, school day requirement within the district. Thanks, Chris. And then just real quickly, I thought I would go ahead and share with you um, the community, our district website. This is the main um, page of the district website. And if you scroll down below Vintage Hall and over on the right-hand side, you'll find the COVID-19 hub. You can also find it in a couple of other places, but that's the easiest place to find it. And um, this was updated from uh, last year. Uh, and there's lots of information here. What you were talking about was the uh, uh, SHUSD positive cases and what you were asking about. And so if you scroll down here, you'll see the chart. And this is a uh, week ending August 27. And there's the one case that uh, Kate mentioned. And again, that's updated every, um, every Friday. There's also uh, just a host of lots of different um, pieces of information. Now what flowchart helps parents and our, our staff to understand uh, what to do. So I just found out I tested for positive, pos I tested positive and or I have symptoms and so on. Uh, and uh, the, I believe this is the, yeah, so this is the quarantine protocols that Kate shared with all of you. I think this is a really helpful chart because it goes step by step uh, and can um, you, you can take some time and look at that again uh, on your own to better understand um, what we are required to do. Okay, again, that's all on the district website under COVID-19. Any other questions, Erica? Do any members of the audience have any additional questions? If so, please hover down towards the bottom of your screen, click on that hand icon to raise your virtual hand. This is Amy again. I think of my many multi-part question, there was like one little bit that, that didn't. That oh, wait, didn't did we miss something? Yeah, I, I'm not, I, I thank you so much. You guys did a great job and I really appreciate um, Kate knowing that you would do that out of an abundance of caution. That's very reassuring actually. Um, but the, the thing was the, the guidelines last year that we were under with the county and the state, mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a threshold that triggered um, the needing to close a classroom or a school or the district. Um, and I right. remember for us, it was 25% of schools in a district, which is one school. So I'm wondering if we still have those thresholds or if it's more taken on a case-by-case -case basis with the department, with the county health department or how that's, how that's handled. Yeah, so if you look at the, um, the public health uh, guidance slash rules um, that are posted on our website and also um, on the, on the uh, public health websites, uh, you won't see those kinds of thresholds now. You know, the emphasis and the goal is to keep children in school. And so uh, the, those percentages are not a calculation at this time for us. However, that being said, um, in the event that uh, there is um, you know, a, a, an outbreak, and that's you know more than three cases. Uh, if public health determines that we do need to um, to close a classroom, a school, um, we will follow in line with those requirements. Kate, anything you'd like to add to that information? I would just emphasize that. Um, we work really closely with public health. And so when those sorts of situations come up, we, we work as a team to make those decisions. 
And, and Amy, I think, you know, we were really pleased last year. We never hit that threshold. We never got to the point of having to close an entire school, which would have closed all four of our schools, as you know. Um, you know, we, we, our students and our staff and our parents, we work diligently to, to be safe. And that's what I'm seeing everyone do again this year. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. Any additional audience members who would like to ask a question? Oh, I have one. We're here. Julie, go ahead and unmute your mic so you may ask your question. Thank you. Um, I was interested in um, knowing if the schools would be sponsoring or somehow hosting um, vaccination clinics for our youngest students when they become available. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, you know, the uh, St. Helena Hospital Foundation has been so supportive with our schools, um, not only uh, St. Helena, um, all of the Up Valley schools. Pope Valley, Hell Mountain, and Calistoga. We hosted some vaccine clinics before our back to school nights most recently. Um, and we had hundreds of 12 plus year olds come to our vaccine clinics um, when we were able to, to hold those. Glenn Newhart is the um, executive director and we were in communication just last week about vaccines and it will take him very little time to uh, gather together and be prepared and mobilized to hold clinics. and. I, I know that he will support us in doing so um, at the point when our you know, five to 11 year olds are, are able to access the vaccine. Chris, I know you've had conversations with them as well. Did I miss anything? Okay, great. Good question, Julie. Thank you. Are there any additional questions from audience members? Give it one more minute or so. Dr. Wilson, again, it, doesn't, it doesn't appear that there are any additional questions. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Again, I want to thank you for participating tonight or watching this um, as it's been recorded uh, through our website. It, it's very complex and uh, our staff works diligently to analyze and implement all of the protocols to ensure the safety of everyone involved in our school community. Again, it's complex. If you uh, have a question, if you've looked at the website, you've looked at the protocols, or you just have a quick question, reach out to site administrators or anyone here at Vintage Hall. I'm happy to answer any questions um, that, that can help you to understand and move forward with your students coming to school. We have almost 100% of our students here with us every day. We're thrilled to have them. Uh, they are happy. They are great in their classrooms. I've been in every school every week since we've came, come back. And uh, it's a really great place for children to learn and grow. So again, thank you for your time tonight, your support, um, your work to uh, continue wearing masks and keeping uh, students' hands clean uh, and uh, keeping a distance when it's appropriate. Thank you again. Have a good night and take good care. <laughs>